Paul Newman, actor, Academy Award winner. Walter Payton, football player, possibly the greatest running back ever. Scott Sharp, college student, his life ahead is a green light. Auto racing, the sport that draws these three very different men together. Their team is running new cars, which must be tested and developed. At the same time, they will put themselves to the test. Peyton, new to racing, seeks to adapt from the playing field to the cockpit. Sharp, just 21, dreams of greatness. Racing the pros, he will find out just how good he is. And Newman, he will help Peyton and Sharp in any way he can. He has his own agenda, unfinished business in this sport he loves. They will talk of gearing and tires, of horsepower and roll bars. They will refine the cars and hone their skills. And when things are right, each will experience control of speed, the mastery of motion. It is the deep appeal of this sport. I'm Sam Posey. I first saw Paul Newman race back in 1972. From the beginning, he did things differently, more deliberately than the others. Maybe it was his age, he was 44. Maybe it was because as an actor, he learned his craft slowly, step by step. The first cars he raced were small, low-powered sedans. And whenever he moved up the ladder to something bigger, it was because he had mastered the class that he was in. Along the way, he won several national championships, set many lap records, and he has proven that he can handle the really big cars that race at Daytona and Le Mans. This year, the opportunity arose for Paul's team to race for a major American automaker, Oldsmobile. And from drawings such as this, the team would develop from the ground up a whole new racing machine. Paul would race one of the new cars in the championship series called the Trans Am the big league, so to speak, for cars of this type. In a hectic summer, he would juggle his dual careers as racer and actor. He would test the new car and race it in four of the 14 Trans Ams, and he would star in three major motion pictures. In addition, he would attend a majority of the Indy car races in his role as co-owner of one of the top teams, his drivers, Michael and Mario Andretti. In the movies, and here we see him on one of the sets with his wife Joanne Woodward, he seemed unafraid to risk his reputation, playing parts that are very different from those which made him famous. And on the roof of his race car, his name stood for much the same thing, a willingness to experiment. Mario looks the new car over. This is Cleveland, Ohio, Paul's first race with the car, and there's a sense of excitement in the air, almost like an opening night. Indeed, for Paul, the worlds of acting and racing each offer him a challenge that sharpens him for the other. At one point in my life, I was bored with, with acting and doing what I had been doing for as many years as I had been doing it, and uh, racing was a welcome uh, pursuit for me. And, of course, Joanne is of the opinion that, that part of my passion for automobiles has bled back into the, my feeling about the theater. Paul's team manager is Bob Sharp. It was Bob's sedan that Paul drove when he began his career. And in the 17 years since then, most of the cars Paul has driven have belonged to Bob. Well, my first choice for a driver would have to be Paul Newman. I've had such great experience with him. He's such a seasoned professional, not only as a race driver, but also as a test driver. Very, very sensitive guy. And Paul would be the kind of a person that I would want to have right from the beginning involved in the team. Bob with his wife Carol and their son Scott. Scott would drive all 14 of the Trans Ams, his first full season of professional racing after three years as an amateur. I really noticed the difference between amateur and professional racing. The teams are so much more organized and the level of preparation so much more. Also the, the caliber of the drivers is so much higher that you're constantly filled with intense competition. Every session, you're competing to be among the top five, and it changes so radically that it's, you have to work hard every moment. Paul, who has been both friend and mentor to young Scott, himself once faced a similar choice between turning pro 
or staying in the comfort zone of amateur racing, which he dominated. Well, at one point I, was, I figured that I would rather be a little fish in a big pond. And a big fish in a little pond, and you're right, it's hard to be camped. I don't think you can go back. Racing the pros demands a high level of concentration, and Paul was afraid that interruptions from movie making might hurt. Bob Sharp wasn't phased. I think Paul was more concerned with finishing up a film and jumping into the race car than we were. We had confidence that Paul's very, very good at concentrating, whether it's on the set, whether it's at the racetrack. When he raced at Cleveland, he put the movies out of his mind and finished a strong fifth. Scott Sharp, meanwhile, was third, visiting Victory Circle for the first time as a pro. A pro one moment, and a kid getting a hug from mom the next. It was a big day for a young man whose primary occupation is that of college student, majoring in finance and investment. My mom is really into the scholastics. She feels that um, getting, while I'm in college, I need to get good grades and concentrate on that. And I wanted to go racing even before I went to college. So I had to work an agreement out with her where I had to prove to her basically that I could get good grades while racing as much as I wanted to. So I sort of have to be on the honor roll every semester. On campus or at the track, Scott always seems to know what he has to do, what's next on his list, and the learning never stops. And since the competition is so much tougher, any time you're on the track, you really have to use that time profitably. And any time we're not working on rebuilding the cars or trying to make them faster, doing research and development, we're off trying to test the, the cars and get them dialed in, get them handling better, anything we can do to try to find an edge. At college, Scott is taught by professors. At the track, he has a professor too, Professor Newman. You know, it's the, it's the Atlanta syndrome. <laughs> It's, you know, you go for a lower gear, but basically what you're doing is you're stopping the car enough so that the gear feels com comfortable on entry. So what you may be doing is, is, is slowing the car down, you know, when you're in a taller gear, okay. even though you're lugging it. You're, 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 right. you're, you're entry is faster. Right. Because it always sounds better. You're like, <laughs> you know? Huh? You're third fastest in this session. I think the track might have slowed up a little bit. Thank you, Scott. <laughs> no problem. I'm fourth. <laughs> For Paul, tutors Scott to a certain extent. Yeah. And then Where'd Scott the goes out and tries to beat Paul. And he, I mean, he wants to. He wants to run in front of Paul. Oh, really? And that's good because it, it motivates him. Paul gave, gave him a lot of help uh, in the years when he yeah, was, was coming up in the amateur ranks. He's been a very strong, positive influence on Scott. I would say that uh, if Scott could call Paul uncle, he would do so. Uh, there's a really wonderful rapport there, a wonderful feeling. He spent so many miles behind the wheel doing testing as well as racing that it's, it's, it's like working with almost like Mario Andretti. Any question I have, he seems like he's experienced that before with the different cars he spent time developing. And so it's really great being able to turn to him and have him always there. When a guy is back here, you, yeah. you always got to look at some time when you're on the throttle. Yeah. You break him. The guy's closing on you because you slowed the car down. Seems like we're pretty easy. So far, we've had a look at two very different men behind the wheel, a great actor and a bright young college kid. And we've seen how their backgrounds are reflected in their approach to the sport. Now for a man who was drawn to racing from a career in pro football. He may just be the greatest running back of all time, Walter Payton. How's everything going? How you doing tonight? Oh, uh, pretty good. Can't race? complain? No. Race day. no that, that, that. Today, Walter no longer plays football. Instead, he owns nightclubs, 28 of them, and does extensive charity work. A man who, like Paul Newman, is not one to rest on his laurels. get it going. Okay. It's strange to think of Walter Payton as a rookie, but in the world of car racing and in his role with the Bob Sharp team, that is exactly what he is. But Payton's ability on the football field, his quickness, his coolness, his intelligence, his balance, are precisely the qualifications of a top racing driver. So it is tantalizing to think what this rookie could do with a couple of years' experience. It's, uh, it's exciting. It's more exciting than anything because you know, to, to start all over again and to, to see yourself climb and uh, 
and mature, you know, it's it's unreal, you know, it makes you feel good. It's not uh, a thing where you're frustrated because you realize that uh, you're just getting in, involved in it. Like Scott Sharp, Walter has found that Paul is an excellent coach. He uh, takes me aside and he tells me, oh, why don't you try this? What about this? You have to do this and that. And, you know, sort of like uh, going to the uh, Webster Dictionary and watching you, know, you, you listen and you talk to him. These things are uh, a fact that you can tell uh, him about. He's an extraordinary athlete. And anybody that make, can make the kind of moves that he makes instinctively on his feet can certainly make that in the car. Uh, racing and football are both mental. And uh, they're... There are phys physical attributes that you have to uh, that go along with it, like in racing, sometimes it's the heat, sometimes uh, it's the, uh, the competition, and making sure that you, you, sometimes you're so tense because the race is so tense itself that you have to stay on top of it and being able to control your physical uh, emotion by, uh, by your mental, then you're uh, in much better control as opposed to a person who doesn't have control over that and you stand a better chance of getting the job done and doing things at an even kill. We'll be back as Paul and Scott race at their home track of Lime Rock, Connecticut. Stay with us. Early in August, the 18-wheeler of the Newman Sharp team rolls toward another racetrack. The lush tranquility of the New England landscape belying the intensity of a season in which this truck will crisscross the country many times as it carries the cars of Paul Newman and Scott Sharp to one series and the cars of Walter Payton to another. On this day, however, the truck is headed to the team's home track, Lime Rock, Connecticut. It's just up the road. Paul and Scott had their first races here. Each time they return, it is a chance to measure their progress to see how they have changed. And to the spectators who come to Lime Rock year after year, Paul is like a member of the family, and Scott is the precocious new kid to root for. Red Sox country, and Newman Sharp country, too. Now Paul and Scott are here with their new cars, along with the car's designer. Bob uh, asked us if we could design a car for Paul, and uh, thought it would be a real interesting uh, engineering project because the gentleman is, uh, is a little later in the normal years that most, uh, most of the young fellows are running, and uh, so he needs something that's, that's designed for someone a little more supple and uh, with good car, car control in the design. So we worked on that aspect of the, of the engineering exercise, and I think we've come up with something that he's pretty happy with. He's running very quick with the car. It's very neutral and, and uh, balanced well, and he's having a good time in it. But he's not a kid, and, and this is the, the engineering problem, is trying to get a car that is uh, uh, drivable and, uh, and for long periods of time. I mean, it's a lot of work out there. He's going very fast. Well, the biggest thing, the biggest boost that he gives us is getting out of the car with a big smile on his face. Uh, that makes us all feel good, because it means that we did a good job, too. His patience and his experience, uh, I believe, help us, and he is always and under control when he gets out of the car and he can explain to you what the car is doing and he puts us more at ease with the car and with him. What did you turn? 53.6. And we got to push still. Yeah. Got to get that out of it. Well, Paul's got uh, a, a very, uh, a very good car sense or Long, a long uh, period of good training, so he's actually quite good. He knows lines, he knows how to pick up the pick up the apex, and uh, uh, he has this fast experience. A driver at a racetrack lives a strange double life. Outwardly, he appears at ease, a gracious point man for his team and his sponsors, as Paul is here as he awards the keys to new Oldsmobiles won in a local raffle. Anyone about to race, however, is about to perform a difficult and exacting task. And on race day, many drivers, Paul Newman included, are beset by nervousness. Joanne Woodward is probably as understanding of this as any racer's wife, because as an actress, she has gone through it all herself. On this day at Lime Rock, she will act like any fan, trying to get a good shot of the famous face behind the wheel. 
Finally, it is time for the race. Paul is qualified seventh and will start from the inside of the third row. His race, however, will last only until the first turn. Boxed in as trouble strikes in front of him, he noses into the rear quarter panel of a spinning car and is himself hit in the rear. As the dust settles and Paul tries to limp to the pits, it becomes clear that the damage is more than just cosmetic. The car is almost undrivable. At his home track, in front of his most avid fans, he will end the day against the guardrail. Every time I take the turn around, I think that uh, it's going to be my last race. As a matter of fact, I sat in the car after Lime Rock and I said, Bonehead. Uh, that's the end. And, uh, you know, it just you're just doing dumb things now. And uh, um, Joanne came back after the race. She said, this is not your last race. <laughs> and, uh, I get a lot of support there. Indeed, Lime Rock was not to be Paul's last race. Exactly 15 days later, he suited up again at a track near Atlanta, Georgia. The team has rebuilt the car, and Paul, who is only days away from beginning his third movie of the year, wants a last taste of a car at speed. He qualifies ninth, but the focus of the team is on young Scott, who qualifies fourth and pushes hard during the opening laps. At the end of the track's longest straightaway, Scott hits oil, locks his brakes, and is out of the race. He's okay, but for the second consecutive race, one of the sharp team cars is damaged. Newman will savor the race on this track where in his earlier years as an amateur, he had won several national championships. On this hot August afternoon, the new car never misses a beat. Two weeks after the Atlanta race, it is Scott's turn to shake off the effects of a crash and to prove he belongs with the pros. This is the track called Mid-Ohio, near Columbus. With Paul's movie now underway, the team's hopes rest with Scott alone. He qualifies eighth. Part of racing is the glamour and the risk, but driving fast is also a craft that has to be learned. After racing with him, Paul has these observations about Scott. 10 years of go-karts can teach you an awful lot about, um, you know, where to be and where not to be and, um, you know, when you can afford to touch and not touch. He can have whatever he wants. Uh, just depends on, on how much he wants it and the rides he's actually at. He, he's another perfect example of, of a really aggressive driver who is, has patience. He can stalk somebody, and, and he gets them when he knows he can get them. And uh, but he, I think he's a world-class driver. In Ohio, driving the still new car in a season that the team looked upon for development more than results, Scott finishes third. Scott's mechanics know they have a driver who can make things happen. Once again, his mother is there to see him succeed. Good job, bud. <laughs> Robert finished fourth? Yeah. yeah. Sweat and bulk. Yeah. 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 That thing is getting louder every lap. But how can an economics major waste so much fine champagne? Because he knows there's more in his future. I'd like to go basically just as far as I can in racing. I think I've been really lucky, and I think I've been able to progress as fast as I'd like to and hopefully I can just keep going and see where that takes me. <laughs> Before racing at the same track in a different class, Walter Payton poses with a fan. Walter's a very, very interesting addition to our team. He's a completely different challenge in that it's not that he's a seasoned racing professional, surely he's a seasoned professional. He's got to have terrific eye-hand coordination, very thinking kind of an athlete, uh, an interesting challenge to us. How do we get Walter 10 years of experience in 10 months? Impossible, but it's a challenge to try to do. In Ohio, 
Peyton starts from the pole, holds his line through the first turn, and as the S's approach, sweetness, as he was called when he played football, leaves his pursuers behind. Speed is not the uh, key ingredient, the thing is uh, being smooth. That's what Paul always said, because a lot of times you think you're going slow, but if you're going smooth, you're going fast. You're not racing basically against the other people in, in, in a manner uh, being so aggressive. What you're doing, you're racing against the track itself. If you can beat the track, then you don't have to worry about everybody else because you're going to beat them. And beat them he does. On this day in Ohio, Walter Payton doesn't run to victory. He drives to victory. We'll be back. Recently, I visited a test track and had a chance to think about the three drivers of the Sharp team. Scott and Walter have years of racing ahead of them, and perhaps they will have the success that Paul has had and acquire his wisdom. So why does Paul keep racing? It certainly isn't for the fame or for the money or maybe even for the taste of victory. It's for this, the feeling of a car at speed, the mastery of motion, gives the life of this extraordinarily gifted individual a dimension it wouldn't otherwise have. I played football and tennis and skiing, and, and I had never found any measure of grace at any of those things, and the only thing that I ever did gracefully was an automobile, so I stuck with it. I guess the most fun about car racing is hanging it out on the edge and being able to hopefully control it at all times because when you're really driving for that lap time whether it be in qualifying or in the race and you really it's really you're going about 10 tenths and there's not much room there for error but you go in it because you enjoy it and it's fun and uh, you just go out and you just enjoy it and as long as that happens you can be like Paul you can do it for the rest of your life Extraordinary men and the cars they drive. Paul Newman, Mario Andretti, each is deeply involved in automobile racing. For Mario, it has been his entire life. For Paul, racing was a casual interest at first, but it has become a passion. Each has redefined the sport in his own special way. Racing is chaos, danger, tension, confusion. Andretti in the middle of all this is calm, supremely capable, drawing strength from the madness. Newman is the man with everything, and he shows that racing offers a challenge that is worth risking everything to meet. Both men are driven to excellence. The Indianapolis Motor Speedway. Once each year, it is filled to overflowing. To this crowd of more than 300,000, automobile racing is something very special. It is the whiff of danger in the air. It is the cars, starkly purposeful, yet extremely beautiful. It is the men who will race, unusual men, gifted physically with superb eyesight, balance, reflexes, hand-to-eye coordination. Men for whom the racing of a car satisfies deeply felt inner needs that cannot be met in any other way. Mario Andretti, world champion and former Indy winner, here about to start his 18th Indy 500, is a man who it would seem was born to race. By contrast, Paul Newman, who is part owner of Mario's team, fell in love with racing relatively late in life. He was 47, and yet he has become one of the country's top sports car drivers. Two very different men, yet both share a fascination with racing, and both have whatever special knack it is that enables certain people to control cars at speeds utterly beyond everyday experience. At Indy, Mario had qualified 11th. Disappointing for a man used to starting up front, but the explanation lay in the newness of the car, a Lola imported from England. Six weeks before, at the team's first race, Paul and Mario discussed the season ahead, knowing full well that the newness of their car would be a handicap, at least at first. Mario 
As the Indy race neared the halfway point, Mario in the Lola was running laps at better than 196 miles an hour. But such was the pace of the race, the highest he had been at any stage was sixth. Nevertheless, the car was running reliably, and there was still plenty of time ahead when Mario was hit from behind. He slammed into the wall, then slid helplessly down the track. The other driver, Johnny Parsons Jr., emerged okay, and then Mario stepped out uninjured from his car, but it had been a close call. I saw that crash at Indy, and for a second I thought to myself, he's done it this time. Hello, I'm Sam Posey, and one thing being a racing driver myself has taught me is that nothing, not your skill, not your fame, not people crossing their fingers for you up in the stands, can make you immune to crashes like that. They go with the territory, so to speak. Have a look at what happened to Paul later in the season at Road Atlanta, and you'll see what I mean. These were the national championships, and in qualifying against the best amateur drivers in the country, Paul had set a new track record as he took pole position seemingly with ease. But that had been on a dry track, and on the morning of the race, it was pouring rain. The car had worked perfectly in the dry. This was a whole new ball game. Other drivers might have been discouraged by this turn of events. Paul took it in stride. An hour before the race, the rain tapered off. As the cars were taken to the grid, it looked as if the race would be run on a track that was partly dry, partly damp. Paul made a point of showing confidence. In the psyching game, you learn to keep your doubts to yourself. As they swept down the hill toward the green flag, Paul got a perfect start and quickly consolidated his lead. At this stage, he seemed in control of the race, but on the ninth lap, his closest pursuer was right on his tail. As the two cars headed toward the hairpin, it was the moment of truth. Both were racing for the lead. In the collision, both cars were damaged. Moments later, Paul was limping toward the pits, driving blind, his hood having blown back over the windshield, when two other cars, still very much in the race, came rushing up behind and tangled violently. Debris flew through the air as Paul, only able to see through the left side window, continued toward the pits, unaware that this was one of the closest calls of his career. Fortunately, neither of the drivers was hurt. Mario at Indy, Paul at Road Atlanta. These were the times things went wrong. The real essence of racing, however, is not chaos, but order. Not danger, but danger held in check by the skill and courage of the participants. The racing driver is only rarely the victim of fate. More often, he makes his own luck, his own destiny. He is someone who is in control, in control of his car, in control of himself. The love of control may begin very early. Any kid who has just learned to ride a bike has felt the first rudiments of the sensation. The more speed, the more power at your beck and call, the better. A go-kart is better than a bike, and a sports car maybe comes next. The top of the ladder is the racing car built for professional racing. These are machines designed to be highly responsive to the driver. The steering is fast, the suspension transmits every undulation of the road, the seat is fitted to the individual driver, the instruments can be seen with barely a glance away from the road. After a few laps, the driver is aware of the car in only the most subliminal way. Really, it has become an extension of himself, and he is going through the corners at 120 miles an hour. He controls centrifugal force. He cuts through the wind. In the perfect merging of the man with the machine, the man becomes the master of movement. This was Riverside, California. The race, one of a series called the Trans Am. Paul, like Mario in the IndyCar series, was running a new car, a turbocharged Datsun, and in this race, it was performing well. At the checkered flag, he was third, beaten only by the two cars that had dominated the entire championship. On the winner's stand with David Hobbs and Willie T. Ribs, Paul looked pleased, and Willie Ribs, well, the control he'd shown in the car, there was no need for that now. The control of the immense energy of a racing car has its corollary in the arts. Consider the actor in a powerful role. Paul, of course, has dealt with both. I really set me up, kid. I asked his wife, Joanne Woodward, how he prepares. Do you think there's anything in his acting background that might have helped him in racing? 
Uh, possibly. I think the, the discipline of acting more than anything, because acting, acting is an enormously disciplined thing to do in terms of work, of preparation, and Paul is extreme about preparation for any film, whether he's acting or directing. And uh, I think all of that kind of preparation lends itself to the work that you have to do as a racer, that you can't just leap into the car and start driving. You know, you really have to know what it's about. It is interesting to see Paul making a movie, as he is here on the set of Harry and Son. He pays strict attention to the smallest details, willing to put in tremendous amounts of behind-the-scenes time in order that the final product be as good as possible. This is the mark of a confident man, someone who knows that he is capable of giving the sort of performance that will justify the work that goes into preparing for it. Consider this clip from the completed movie. Senior editor. Well, it's a real pisser, ain't it? Yeah. The actor and the racing driver both must do what they do entirely on their own. In racing, there are teams, of course, just as there are production companies in the movie business. But just as the actor is finally alone in front of the camera, the racing driver is alone in his car. The racing team operates sequentially, with responsibility shifting in stages from the designer to the fabricators to the mechanics, and lastly, to the driver. Alone in his car, the racing driver is also alone in the pits before the race, and signing autographs and making small talk with strangers only seems to deepen the isolation. But this is as it should be. In the hours before a race, the driver begins to shut himself off from anything that could affect his concentration. In any case, the people he knows best at the track are his own mechanics, and they are preoccupied with the last-minute preparation of the car. At the track, the car is the driver's alter ego. It receives as much attention, or more, than he does, and any success he may achieve must be shared with the car. On one hand, the driver wants the best car he can get, but when it is too good, the driver's role is diminished. Paul Newman once won a race with a car he described as being so good, Shirley Temple could have won with it, and he wasn't happy when he said it. One solution is to be closely identified with your car, to be a great test driver. Mario Andretti is this way. This was a track called Road America in central Wisconsin. On the card for a midsummer weekend of racing, an unusual double header, a race for the Indy cars with Mario competing and a Trans Am in which Paul would race. These events were held on the same day, although not at the same time. Paul began his race in fourth behind the Camaros of Hobbs, Ribs, and Forbes Robinson. Mario, in his race, later in the afternoon, started from the pole, the Lola, now much improved as a result of extensive testing. Both cars had been carefully prepared by their respective crews, and at first, both appeared to run perfectly. Paul continued in fourth in the Trans Am, although dropping back slightly, while Mario, in his race, dropped back to third. What no one in the vast crowd could know was that aboard Mario's car, there was a problem. The clutch had failed, and now Mario was having to mesh the gears cautiously with each ship. Paul was suffering no such handicap. His car was running perfectly until, until with no warning, the most trivial thing happened deep in the engine compartment. The air intake hose collapsed and the engine just stopped. Not with a bang, not pouring smoke. The spectators might have imagined that Paul had pulled off for no reason at all, while Paul, who only moments ago had been in full command of 600 horsepower, could only sit on the grass and hope for a ride back to the pits. A broken clutch may be a lot more expensive to fix than a collapsed intake hose, but it doesn't stop the car. Nor would Mario's next problem, the failure of the valve that controls the turbocharger boost. This meant his engine was making less horsepower and his speed was slower on the straight. He tried to radio the crew so repairs could be made during a pit stop, but the radio wouldn't work. Other drivers might have been furious with the car, or mad at the crew, or even aware that the crowd, not knowing what was wrong, might think the driver himself was slowing down. 
but Mario Andretti did not waste his energy in this way. At each pit stop, he would face the problem of getting the clutchless car underway again without stalling. Tricky and time-consuming. Strangely, however, despite Mario's problems, he was moving up as breakdowns and crashes thinned the field. His crew signaled that he was fourth, then third. Paul stood with Mario's crew and marveled at Andretti's skill. You gotta remember, for over a third of that race, Mario was driving with no clutch. And for him to park that thing, take on fuel, get a push, mesh the gear exactly in first gear and not stall it and still go uphill out of the pits at Elkhart. And that to me is, uh, I can't describe the reverence that I feel for anybody that is able to do anything like that. That's yeah. just extraordinary. Knowing how to cope with a problem like a broken clutch is one thing, but racing an imperfect car and not letting it mar your concentration, that's another. Mario, naturally, has been through it all before in the course of his long career. In racing, character can mean as much as pure speed. Usually, the driver must share his glory with his car. Today, this victory is a triumph of tenacity more than anything else. When you win, you forget all about those things. Uh, all of a sudden, you didn't have any problems. Uh, but again, the win is always a win. It's like the first time, as you know. It's just, uh, that's why we want to keep doing it, because it's a great reward. I'm not bored with what I'm doing, and I'm thankful for that. I don't need a hobby per se. I do other things. I don't have a steering wheel in my hands every day. But, uh, but again, I think I do this probably more than anything else. In a full summer of racing, there is no time off. Consider the travel. The Trans Am was comprised of 12 races, 11 in the US, one in Canada. The Indy cars raced 13 times, and both Paul and Mario added numerous other races to their schedules. In his life of non-stop traveling, there are times when a racer hears his crew chief's knock on his motel room door, looks around in the half-light of early morning, and has no idea where he is. It is a life of restaurant meals, of hurried phone calls home to your family. Interviews with the local media lose their meaning as you hear yourself using stock answers to questions you've answered dozens of times before. Questions like, how's your car? Why do you race? Aren't you afraid? For the teams, today's racing season is a logistical maze. The big semis that carry the cars crisscross the continent on the road day and night. In this world of never-ending change, there are a few constants. The crowds are always there. Both Paul and Mario are adored by the fans who chant, we love you, Mario, and hound Paul for autographs. In fact, much of the strength each man brings to racing comes from a sort of collective consciousness of people rooting for him. Standing around the car while adjustments are made, this you do by the hour. Drivers chat with each other, but it's rarely more than small talk. You want to keep your guard up, not let the other man know what you're really thinking. But it is being in the car that is the real essence of the driver's summer. The tracks change under your wheels, and the scenery flashing by looks a little different. But always there is that roar in your ears, the feel of the wheel in your hands, the sweaty cocoon of the cockpit. Mostly there is that deep welling of personal effort, trying as hard as you can possibly try. Afraid of failure, dreaming of success, too busy with the road ahead to think of anything else. Now and then, that road leads you somewhere special, somewhere where everything seems that much more vivid. Indians like that there. And for Paul, Lime Rock. Lime Rock is a track set in the northwestern corner of Connecticut. You could call it Paul's home track. He lives about an hour and a half away, and this is where he first raced. Joanne usually comes to watch him race here, and this time was no exception. Superstar or not, Paul is like the rest of us in that he loves to do well when he races in front of his family. This was Labor Day. The race, not a Trans Am, but a national, which is run to slightly different rules and requires a different car. Paul raced nationals whenever he could wedge them in between other events. His early successes were in races like this, and even with the pressures of his schedule, he continues to race nationals, thriving on the challenge of running two different cars in the same season. Here's Mario talking about Paul. Uh, a lot of people think, have a tendency to really say, well, of course, Paul Newman will have the best. He does have good equipment, uh, but he, uh, he's doing a good job with that equipment. And, um, and that's the important thing. So again, he blends into the quality as a race driver and quality equipment. He has the results to, to show for that. Paul has raced and won nationals at Summit Point, Brainerd, 
Mid-Ohio, West Palm Beach, Riverside, Mid-America, Watkins Glen. Twice he has won national championships. On this day at Lime Rock, it was another convincing victory, and the winner's circle looked like a family reunion. This was the start of the Las Vegas IndyCar race. Mario, third fastest in qualification. They're off. Tio Fabi, the Italian, takes the lead. John Paul, the rookie sensation, is second. Mario, fourth into turn one. A moment later, he's sixth. It's a short track, roughly a mile long. Five turns, all left-handed. This is the desert out behind the parking lot at Caesars Palace. A strange, artificial place for a track, but this is great racing. Last turn, first lap. John Paul now leading. Garrett Daly second. Bobby back to third. Pete Halsmer fourth. Now Mario. Close traffic at 120 miles an hour. This is where the driver needs all his driving technique, plus his sense of tactics and the knowledge of his opponents. Cockpit temperatures are high, 130 degrees or more. The driver's heart rate is three times normal. The car changes steadily as the fuel load lightens, the brakes wear down, the tires lose their early grip. There's oil on one of the turns, sand on another. The wind changes direction. The driver accommodates all this with a steady flow of decisions. He brakes earlier here, later there. He changes his approach to the turn, not by yards or feet, by inches. It's a game of details, thousands of them. But the challenge doesn't daunt the driver, it exhilarates him. This is what he lives to do. This is what he can never describe, never even remember afterwards. It is to be lived now and only now. The risk, the endless travel, the anxiety of his family, all this is part of an equation which is rendered meaningless now. And then there is something else. We love it. You don't just uh, win or lose. You want to win. And if you don't win, you're just mad. And, and you're not a good loser. Because if you're a good loser, you're a fool. Winning, that's something dreamed about a lot in this city of lights. But the racer's vision of winning is different. It's something to be achieved on his own terms, not with the turn of a card. Late in the race now, Andretti leading, a man driven to excellence. World champion 1978, winner the Indy 500, winner dozens of major races around the world. These achievements, like Paul's best movies, don't cushion a failure, they make it harder because when you've succeeded, you know what it's like. That's why a winner will always take a loss harder than someone used to losing. One pit stop to go. The driver has become so accustomed to speed on the track that it is being stopped that seems strange. He won't feel right again till he's back at speed. Last lap, and the checkered flag. Mario Andretti wins another one. Because I think uh, we had the best car out here today, for sure, and uh, that's tremendous satisfaction for all of us, everyone that worked so hard to make this happen. Uh, that seems like makes up for all the lost ground that we had up to now. What a moment for Paul and Mario, who had started the season so badly. Through their mutual efforts, they had turned it around. Each spoke highly of the other. He is something that is out of a different mold. I mean, he is such a complete professional. and He's very valuable because at least when we talk shop, uh, certainly he does understand what I'm talking about. And, uh, and he keeps the crew up and keeps them mindful. I mean, I'm just lucky to have an association with him. Uh, he's, he's been great. He's, uh, he's been a total asset to the team, uh, not only just as an owner, just to have him around. Two men, two lives that came together through the shared passion for a very special sport.